Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Este se lo dejamos a Rafael. Eh, es, es un honor para mí presentar a quien ya ahora considero un amigo de trabajo, eh, Andrew Pinsent, el director de investigación del Liam Ramsey Center. Andrew Pinsent, como pueden ver, es sacerdote católico, pero antes de estudiar teología, de recibir su doctorado, ha estudiado física en Oxford, trabajado en, en el CERN, en Ginebra, y ha hecho también un doctorado en teología con la profesora Eleanor Stump sobre virtudes en Santo Tomás de Aquino. Y hoy nos va a hablar sobre la perspectiva de la segunda persona, un proyecto conjunto entre ciencia, filosofía y teología. Right, I'll just set this up for a moment, if you be patient. Mientras procedemos con unos pequeños inconvenientes técnicos, eh, ahí estamos. Quisiera comentarles que con el doctor Pinsen hace ya casi más de un año y medio, dos años, eh, se nos ocurrió el proyecto Ciencia y Religión en América Latina y que gran, gran parte de todo esto que está pasando se lo debemos a él. Gracias, Sandro. I'm delighted to be here. We have a phrase in English, to wear a different hat, which means to take on a different role. And today I'm wearing a different collar for this talk, because as well as being a scientist and a philosopher, some years ago I trained to be a Catholic priest. And I have quite an unusual position working in academia at Oxford University uh, in the area of science and religion. But because of the, my three interests in science, philosophy and theology, I'm particularly excited about this new area of study which is becoming um, increasingly important across many areas of philosophy and psychology, and I hope in future also theology. So the second person perspective, a common project of science, philosophy and theology. What I want to do in this um, brief presentation is to apply certain insights that are coming out of science, particularly the last 10 years, and they've come, they've been interpreted by philosophers, and I'm going to use them to try to solve a theological problem. And then I'm going to suggest how um, some of the insights in, in, in that theological problem may in fact in turn feed back into philosophy and perhaps even into some future scientific research. The area of shared interest I'm looking at is second-person relatedness. And in some ways, this is incredibly um, commonplace and trivial. Every time you address someone as you, um, you're already using the second-person form of address. So this is the line of my presentation. I'm going to look first at the science, interpreted by philosophers, then round to theology, and then to philosophy, and then back to science. I'm not, a great, I'm not a great believer in the integration of science and theology. I think that's a mistake. But I do believe there can be fruitful interaction on particular topics, particularly topics connected with the human person. So what do we mean by the second person? Well, it's a funny thing in grammar, because it, grammatically the second person is rather odd. We address someone as you, who is present to us in some way. We don't address someone as he or she if they're present. Um, 
Uh, on the other hand, if they're absent, we'll say he, she, we won't say you. Um, there are things about the second person in grammar which are rather unusual. And in the 20th century, um, philosophers, or a few philosophers, began to become very interested in this, particularly um, the philosopher Martin Buber. Uh, ich und du, which is translated as I and thou in English, and I think Yo y tu by um, uh, Horacio Crespo in 1969 uh, into Spanish. In recent years, studies in experimental psychology, especially in social cognition, have begun to put work on second-person relatedness on an empirical basis. I think that's what's so interesting about what's being done in the last 10 years or so. Well, in order to get an, an empirical and experimental uh, understanding of this, um, we've got to look at an area called joint attention. And what do we mean by joint attention. Well, any of you who've had children will know um, that the interactions begin um, very early on. Professor Chappell this morning was talking about the fact that when um, his first daughter was born, she had this intense look at his face, uh, even within a few minutes of being born. And that's something rather extraordinary. A baby who's just been born has never seen a human face before. But the baby latches onto the face and begins that relationship um, straight away, as soon as possible. And um, children uh, very quickly begin to engage in various kinds of uh, attention with other persons. Um, they'll follow the gaze of other persons. They'll point, point at things to catch the attention of other persons, which is an invitation to engage in joint attention with another person. Now, I'm a great um, fan of the work of a, of a professor in London at University College London at the Tavistock Clinic. And this is a man called Peter Hobson. And Peter Hobson has been devising some uh, very subtle experiments to try to understand joint attention. And this is his working definition. So part of joint attention involves sharing an awareness of the sharing of focus with another person. And here you can see the two children are looking together at some toy. So there's a kind of triangle, there's a kind of triangle, the two persons sharing attention at a common object. And they're also sharing an attitude towards the thing or event in question. They're, um, they're both taking an interest. Their, part, their interest is partly because the other person is interested. So people enjoy uh, being engaged in joint attention with other persons. Incidentally, uh, a lot of this work is done with young children and infants because as um, human beings grow up, we acquire many um, sophisticated ways of communicating with one another. Um, but this is going on all the time, including in adult relationships, of course. Um, but with children, it's a purer form uh, we, because, in fact, that's the main way they begin to engage with other persons. And quite early on, uh, uh, well, early on in, in this research, I mean, about five years ago, um, philosophers began to wonder whether joint attention has something to do with the second person form of grammar. And they began to speculate that perhaps this is how we begin to learn the second person form of grammar. Um, Johannes Rosler, for example, has argued that joint attention is already second personal even before language is acquired. Well, I think these are good intuitions, and uh, I respect them. But what's, but what's been particularly exciting the last few years is that we've been able to put some of these ideas on an empirical basis. And the key, um, the, the window into this, particularly, has been the study of autism. Autism has been a means and a motive to explore uh, these areas. And if you've never heard of this, I do strongly recommend this book. It's called The Siege, The Siege by Clara Claiborne Park. And this is, this is the, um, the, the story of a mother bringing up an autistic child. And this was long before um, people really understood very much about autism. And she was a, a university lecturer, and she didn't really know what she was dealing with. And she began to write down her experiences, and she told the story, and it's still one of the classic works on the study of autism. And early on, 
um, she realized that there was something a little bit wrong with her child, Ellie, because Ellie would never point at anything. She would never draw attention to anything. Even at the, by the age of two, she would never actually pointed at anything to catch someone's attention. Now, in recent years, there have been a series of empirical tests um, uh, in the area of autism. And this, uh, these have suggested that a diagnosis of autism is strongly correlated with a failure to engage in joint attention. It's one of the strongest signals uh, of an autistic condition. What we do know, partly because of uh, Peter Hobson's experiments and others, is that um, those with autism have no particular difficulty recognizing persons. They know there are pers that persons are different in the world, and they're as good at doing that uh, as anyone else. But they do have a strange difficulty with grammar. And this was noted, uh, in fact, in the original um, study of the syndrome by uh, Leo Kanna. Um, they, they switched round the first and second person forms in grammar. It's called pronoun reversal. So in English, if I say, how are you, to someone with autism, um, it's more likely that they will respond, you is fine. They won't say, I am fine, because there are funny rules for grammar for the second person. And so putting these two things together suggests that autism inhibits specifically second person relatedness and therefore helps to teach us about what these things do. I won't go into this in any detail, but there's a fascinating experiment uh, in London recently, and um, looking at how uh, a group of autistic children would, just, would respond to instructions to carry out particular tasks. And they could observe persons and recognize persons. They could follow instructions. They could understand goals, understand actions, but they didn't appropriate the attitudes of the other person. Um, and in Hobson's words, they were not moved. Just briefly, autism isn't the only syndrome to teach us about some of these things. There's a, there's a very rare syndrome called Williams syndrome, um, which is almost like the opposite of autism. And it, one of its characteristics is that there's hyper-attention to faces. Um, almost like someone locked onto your face. And uh, it's, it's not quite, it, there's a lack of common sense to it. But it's, it's, there are other conditions besides autism helping to teach us about this relationship. Okay, so that's the science of philosophy. Now, I want to look briefly now, philosophy to theology. The last two parts of the talk will be quite short. Now, I want to look now just briefly at another area, and this is a mystery. And uh, it began with the issue about the virtues. About 50 years ago, um, there was a, a change in the fashion of philosophy, particularly in ethics. And philosophers of ethics began to be interested again in the virtues. This would have gone out of fashion for a while, and then suddenly they thought, this is an interesting thing, we ought to do more work on it. And part of the uh, motivation for doing this is that we, we don't just judge actions as being good or bad, or just and unjust, um, we also judge persons as being good, bad, just, unjust, generous, dishonest, prudent, greedy, and so on. Now, when we began to dust off the old books of virtues, um, the, uh, what most philosophers began to do is focus back to the tradition of Aristotle, who really taught the Western world virtue ethics perhaps the most important and influential book on ethics ever written, the Nicomachean Ethics. And this has become, in modern philosophy, once again, the canonical text, um, the canonical text of virtue ethics. So even if people disagree with Aristotle, they will go back to him as the person to disagree with. That's the reference point for virtue ethics. Now, Thomas Aquinas, uh, I assume you all know who he is, uh, the, perhaps the most important doctor of the Catholic Church, uh, one of the greatest philosophers and theologians of the Western tradition. And in the 13th century, he did a great deal to, to use the work of Aristotle to understand him, reinterpret him uh, in the light of Christian revelation. And he wrote an extraordinary amount about the virtues. Um, most students who start to study Thomas Aquinas learn about his five proofs for the existence of God. Uh, and in the Summa, his greatest work, that's one article. He wrote 1,004 articles on the virtues and associated matters. That's what he, one of the areas he thought most important. But this is the problem. We know we have his words, 
we have lots of details about what he wrote, but we don't have a picture. We don't really see what he's getting at. Um, it's like knowing every bone of the human body, but you've never met a living human being. So when we study Aquinas' virtue ethics, we can write a rule book, we can write a textbook, we can write a manual, we can write tables of what he's done, but we have a problem seeing the whole picture. Incidentally, even in uh, Aristotelian virtue ethics, there are many problems. Um, Aristotle has taught the Western world to understand virtue as habituation uh, in, in accordance with practical reason. So he, he imagines virtues as, uh, are like practicing a musical instrument. You get better by practicing good actions. Incidentally, it doesn't quite work even for Aristotle. Um, it's not clear in his text how you become courageous in facing death by habituation. Um, uh, you have to do, you have to be face dangerous situations on a regular basis. But Aristotle says, if you survive, then you become a professional, and that's not true courage. So it's a little bit puzzling. Now, when we come to Aquinas on the virtues, um, we discover that um, there are many, many strange changes between a virtue in Aristotle and the virtue according to Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas thinks the genuine virtues come from God, that they, they come all at once, they can be lost all at once, they're unified through love, um, and there are many other strange properties. So when someone trained in Aristotle reads Thomas Aquinas, um, there are all these mysteries. It's very, very peculiar. And we don't have a picture of what he's getting at. I won't go into the details, but it's very, very weird. And the last um, uh, 30 years or so, analytic philosophers have been writing a lot of papers about the differences between Aquinas and Aristotle on the virtues. Now, um, I spend a lot of time looking at the structure of Aquinas' work. And the first thing that struck me, looking at his studies of the virtues, is that he doesn't just talk about virtues. He talks about four things, three of which are, are drawn from Christian revelation. So there's virtues, there's gifts, there's beatitudes, and there are fruits. Virtues, gifts, beatitudes, and fruits. And we don't understand any of this. What is a gift? What is a beatitude? What is a fruit? Why are they interconnected? Why does he think they're important? Why does he think the virtuous life is in some way linked to these other strange things? Now, when we discuss these questions, I must anticipate an objection, because, of course, now we must enter Aquinas' theological universe. This is the world of a man who believes that there is a God, that the God corresponds to the God of Christian revelation, and that God has a particular goal for human beings, which is to, be, to have friendship with human beings. Um, this is very different to Aristotle. Aristotle says we cannot be friends with God. He believes there is a God, but God is remote from us and friendship is impossible. Nevertheless, um, when we've done the theology, it's then possible to come back and look at the philosophy because even outside of Aquinas' theology, um, this, this work has important implications. Now, Aquinas adds virtues to gifts, and these two things he thinks work together. And when he thinks that there's a virtue working, he thinks we move ourselves with respect to some kind of object. We have, um, uh, we have movement and a stance towards a particular thing. But when we have gifts, he says we're moved by God to have a stance towards a particular thing. And he says by means of a gift, a person is disposed to be readily movable by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's, let's imagine what he's saying here uh, with a little picture. So there's a person with the virtues on the left, um, symbolically, and some object on the right. So that might be me and a chocolate cake. And if I have the virtue of temperance, I'll have the right attitude towards the chocolate cake, not to eat too much, uh, eat to eat moderately, and so on. Now, when Aquinas describes a gift, there's a triangle involved. There's a person with the gifts, some object, and he thinks God's got involved in moving us with respect to the object. This is triangular association. So having looked at that, I spent a while trying to work out what being moved by God means in this context. And there's one bad image. So when people say God moves me, they sometimes think, well, maybe it's a bit like this, that, you know, uh, I'm being moved around by force, 
God's more powerful than I am, and so on. And Aquinas completely rejects this interpretation. Another way of thinking about it might be that God gives us information, as if we've got radio antennas in our heads, and he's transmitting information to us. That's a little bit more subtle, um, but that doesn't work either. And my proposal is that the correct metaphor, and this is one we could not have found uh, even 10 years ago, the correct metaphor for understanding what Aquinas meant in the 13th century uh, is joint attention. Um, in Aquinas' moral, moral framework, the gifts enable a joint attention relationship with God. To use modern terminology, that is what he's talking about. And it's a bit of a long, it's a kind of a, uh, it's a long investigative process. But when you look at the way he describes these dispositions, they match very, very nicely with what a modern um, experimental psychologist how, uh, would describe as interacting um, with another human person through joint attention. I won't go into this now. Incidentally, although this has been done through the study of um, Aquinas' work on the virtues and gifts, I think there are symbols of this already in, in art. As Professor Lascano reminded us yesterday, there's metaphor in scripture. There's metaphor in scripture, but metaphor is important. It's not just an optional extra. And so it's very interesting in this depiction of the Garden of Eden by Jacob de Bacca, that it looks as if they're engaging in joint attention relationship to God, second person relationship to God. And in that document by um, uh, then uh, Ratzinger, uh, Joseph Ratzinger in the 1960s, um, he was describing the beginning of the human person distinctively as a person is when the person says you um, to God. But of course, a few minutes later, the, um, the, the relationship to God is lost through sin, and then you've got the expulsion from paradise and then a lot of other problems. Uh, on the right, of course, there's a very interesting icon of the Trinity, which I think expresses some of the same ideas. Now, um, putting those two areas of research together, the modern research in joint attention and autism, and then the study of Aquinas on the gifts and the virtues, as I think gives us a new set of metaphors for understanding um, his virtue ethics, which is non-Aristotelian. Um, in Aquinas' moral framework, the gifts remove a universal initial state of human beings, a state of spiritual autism. And so another way of describing nature and grace is that grace is a state in which the spiritual autism is, is got rid of uh, and there's second person relationship to God. I stress when I say this, it's a metaphor. Um, autism in the usual sense of the word is a state of innocence and doesn't preclude possession of the gifts. So, okay, so that's uh, the science of philosophy and then applying it to the theological problem. And now I want to look back at the theology uh, to the philosophy very briefly. So an obvious objection to Aquinas' work is that, yes, it's all theological, but do you have to accept um, all his theological premises, that there's a God, that there's a Christian God, and that God wants friendship to human beings? Does Aquinas' virtue ethics have any validity or usefulness beyond that context? And I suggest that the answer is yes. Aquinas' key insight is that to develop the virtues, to develop human character, is inherently linked to joint attention relationships with other personal agents. And in many instances, a parent, a friend, uh, a significant caregiver of a child could play the part of a second person in a non-theological account of the virtues. And what's interesting is it fills in a lot of the holes, a lot of the problems with Aristotle's account of the virtues. And, and here's an example of temperance. Temperance, learning to eat the right things at the right time. How do we get started with temperance? Aristotle doesn't really explain because he says we already have to have practical wisdom to choose what is good. So how does virtue begin in the first place? How do people begin to develop temperance and the other virtues? Well, there's an example. Any of you who had a child will know that feeding a child is, not a, is a messy business. And it begins often with um, uh, a lot of food on the floor. But the key thing is the child is interested not so much in the food, but in the relationship 
um, with uh, the parent normally and engaging in joint attention um, with the parent. So we acquire uh, even the virtue of temperance, an Aristotelian virtue, in a non-Aristotelian way um, by second person interaction, an I to a you. And, it's, and this approach is able to solve a lot of other problems. One of the most puzzling things in Aquinas' account of the virtues is how we can um, gain the virtues and lose the virtues instantly. It's so, it seems so peculiar. It's so different from a process of habituation. But if the goal of the virtue is a relationship of friendship with another person, in, in Aquinas' case, it's God, of course, um, but it could also be, in a, in a secular analogy, um, the relationship of a husband and wife, for example. Um, if the goal of the virtues is a second-person relationship, then it's possible to gain the virtues or lose the virtues instantly. Um, one act of betrayal prevents the really means that all the virtues, the dispositions of orderly life, um, they won't suddenly vanish, but they will cease to be effective as virtues until there's an act of reconciliation. So even in everyday sense, virtues can be lost or recovered immediately if they're understood as virtues of a relationship. So I think Aquinas' work on the virtues, although it's theological work, will uh, and is going to inspire um, new ways of thinking about virtue in a broader philosophical context and also a lot of other fields, uh, um, bringing up children, for example. And this is uh, going to highlight the role of second-person relationships. And his work may also reinforce a lot of conventional wisdom about human relationships and character development, particularly the importance of shared games and activities in raising children. And finally, very briefly, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about how this might play into some scientific research. It's not easy to do it, but it might be, there might be a way in future of exploring character development uh, empirically um, particularly for the study of autistic spectrum disorder. We know those with autism um, are slow to develop certain kinds of virtues, like the virtue of gratitude. Incidentally, they're also slow to develop a lot of vices, like gossiping or cursing or hating. Um, so they're immune from those vices as well. And um, because in some ways this is teaching us about the second person relationship, um, they may help to uh, teach us about the role of that relationship in the acquisition of virtues and to some extent the acquisition of vices. And through experimental psychology, it may be possible to devise some experiments to put these observations on a scientific basis. I've been in discussion with Peter Hobson about some ways we might try to do that. I also think there are many other fields um, where uh, or either the field directly or associated fields where this kind of work and these kinds of ideas are developing in future. Obviously, joint attention there. Um, animals don't engage in joint attention in quite the same way, but there's something a little bit like it in some respects. And certainly, many animals seem to like certain kinds of joint actions with human beings. So there's a boy uh, and his dog there, for example, um, all looking very interested at something. And also, um, in the area of neuroscience, uh, we now know, as Professor Chappell was saying this morning, there are certain areas of the brain that seem to be um, hardwired for interaction with other persons in a second personal way. And so there are many fields where, where these ideas could develop in future. Experimental psychology, uh, autism, Williams syndrome, joint attention, social cognition in animals, um, beyond the selfish gene, you might say. There's some interesting work on this um, by uh, the primatologist Franz de Waals. He's written a book called The Age of Empathy, and he's got a, a many years of experience in the animal kingdom looking at uh, the phenomenon of empathy in animals. Um, neuroscience, uh, the mirror neuron system, uh, other possible, uh, uh, possible other directed correlations in neuroscience. Uh, and in theology, I think there are all kinds of theological questions where this will give us a new toolkit. Um, nature and grace, determinism and free will. Um, natural and supernatural, and so on. And then, and then the unifying area for a lot of these will actually be philosophy, good training in philosophy to be able to transfer insights from one field to another. And I'd like to conclude with an extraordinary uh, paragraph in the Christian tradition um, where Augustine has converted to Christianity 
and he gives this um, extraordinary um, statement of confession to God. Uh, and look at the grammar. Uh, late have I loved you. I loved you. You were there. I was here. Um, it's a completely different kind of writing to the writing of Aristotle, who says that God is good, God is perfect, God is eternal, but he never addresses God as you. I, th I hope over the longer term that Aquinas' insights, together with new research, may help to, to promote a kind of Copernican revolution in the understanding of the virtues in general. This revolution will shift um, the center of explanation from the first person to the second person perspective, as well as showing a fruitful mutual interaction of science, philosophy, and theology. Thank you very much.